So let's wrap up this little history lecture on architecture by looking at two different baseball stadiums. On the left, we have Fenway Park, 1912, and it just celebrated its 100th anniversary in 2012. Notice how the geometry of the urban grid has formed the building. And also notice that they have something here called the Green Monster. This is a 40 foot high left field fence, which creates all kinds of drama and intrigue in a baseball game. And so all of a sudden Fenway Park has this relevance to the culture and, and uh, through its uniqueness and its innovation that makes it transcend time and place. On the other hand, we have Veterans Stadium from Philadelphia, which was built in the 1970s at the height of the industrial world view. And here you see a building that's disconnected from its urban context and a sea of parking around it. It really has no sense of place or sense of community. Um, wasn't the greatest place to watch a baseball game. I went to many. Um, when the team won, of course, it was a little bit better. Um, so let's see what happened to these two stadiums over time. Which one do you think was more sustainable? Well, in Boston, after the Boston bombing uh, last year, many of the urban, uh, many of the ceremonies celebrating or commemorating the experience were actually held in Fenway Park. Um, one, because it holds a lot of people, but, but one, because the park itself is part of the collective culture of Boston and therefore I would consider it to be a highly sustainable building versus the one on the right, Veteran Stadium, was actually blown up in 2004, literally blown up. So it certainly didn't meet the level of aesthetics or visual appeal that we would expect. Um, it didn't meet the community levels that Maslow would expect. And certainly, considering the building was made of 100% concrete, the amount of CO2 that was emitted into the atmosphere to create that structure is maybe one of one of the records. I'm not quite sure. I'll have to get that fact for you. So there's there's an example of how how transcendent sustainability plays out. So let's take a look at the same hierarchy of need, needs now, but through the lens of sustainability and design. So at the base of the level, we have safety and security. Buildings need to be safe, but also they have to have heating and cooling and plumbing and power. They have to do that for now, but also allow future generations to have those same opportunities to have heating and cooling. That means taking care of our resources. At this level, we want to create a sense of community, a sense of culture, some social equity, some economic viability, and certainly viable shared public space. So these, again, are, are design directives. And at the top is the sense of beauty, uniqueness, self-sufficiency, the idea that architecture and design that can meet all of these, and I mean all of them all simultaneously, could be considered to be transcendently sustainable. So how does that really play out? Well, this is a little bit of a chart that we use to look at different buildings. Going vertically is the sense of aesthetics and visual appeal and sensory expectations, along with the um, sense of community. So this is our subjective line. And this is our objective line of measuring the amount of resource efficiency of a given building. So let's see, um, just take a few examples from, the, from that group and see how they play out. So if I look at 1970s solar architecture, for example, very, very efficient, but actually left little to the soul and was very low in the measurement of transcendence. And at the top left, we have Bilbao, which has a high level of trans transcendence but is really beyond wasteful. It's really kind of unethical in its use of resources. And then we have the Veteran Stadium, which is both wasteful and uninspiring and therefore gets blown up. And our goal really is to get up here. We wanna be up into the transcendent sustainability. So if you're designing a building, if you're trying to be sustainable, there is where you'd like to be. And that's really, this course is laying the groundwork for us to get to that level. And so studying different buildings in the matrix reveals how projects can be designed to meet all of human needs, not just now, but also into the future. That's, that's a huge difference than what architects have dealt with before. So as I wrap up this lecture, let's just remind ourselves of what we're trying to do as designers. We want to create meaningful experiences in spaces and places and with objects, which will lead to the creation of places and objects of cultural significance. Those then can persist and be renovated through time, thereby preserving resources for future generations. Pretty simple actually, but not easy to do. So how does this play out as we wrap up here? We have to, in order to get to the quadruple bottom line, we're gonna to have to leap over the razor's edge. And so I'm gonna start by talking about this, this horrible statement, sustainable design is just part of good design. If good design was sustainable, then we really wouldn't be in this environmental fix that we're in now. So I, I think we need to reject that and move to a new statement that says great design, and we saw many examples of that.
Great design is an integral part of authentic sustainability. So we begin to realize that design is a factor within sustainability and therefore really critical to the future of the planet. So let's see how that plays out again. Um, here we see the green plateau and the idea of business as usual or design as usual. And here's what most architects and designers are doing. They're saying, I'm going to integrate green practices into my design principles. And I'm going to argue in this course, and I'll argue till the end of time, that that will not work in the long term. That all that will do is mitigate our impact and create a sense of greenness. And we know that green is less bad. What we'd like to do is think about a sustainable future. Think about how we can integrate great design as usual into authentic sustainability so that design becomes one of the major drivers of what we might consider a sustainable future. Maybe we can do that. So as that, how does that look? Well, this is the actual layout of the quadruple bottom line. And this is where I want to mention that this concept of the quadruple bottom line was developed in collaboration with Ann Sherman, um, MSSD student 11, as part of her thesis um, in order to graduate from our program. So here's the triple bottom line. On the right, we see a sense of a shear zone uh, with economics being really critical. And over here on the left, we see another um, triple bottom line with another shear zone. So let's see how that plays out. So if I look at the quadruple bottom line here and I add the experiential bottom line, I now have four bottom lines. And here we see as not surprising that right now in society, the economic bottom line weighs much more heavily than the other two and now three aspects of what would form the quadruple bottom line. However, if we look over here at the um, quadruple bottom line in design school, for example, we have an overemphasis on the experiential bottom line. And all of you who went through design school will tell you that, and I'm not saying this wasn't right, but it was problematic that we got so much information on how to create great experiences that we left behind the sense of environmental responsibility, the sense of economic viability, and the sense of social equity. Now, as, as design schools, we want to begin to move those tectonic plates vertically to create to vertically align our values to create a really 21st century design program. So now we have the quadruple bottom line. This gives us, and I say us, I really mean everyone, but certainly for designers, gives us the opportunity to participate in a very deep and meaningful level. So now here is the, I know we're, this is a long lecture, we're almost at the end. Here is the great tent of sustainability. This is a plan view of something that sustainability still remains relatively unclear in the minds of people. And maybe that's not so bad. Maybe it's about quality of life, well-being, resilience. Um, but maybe we know, for example, that the triple bottom line is part of sustainability. So for example, economic viability is critical for a sustainable future. If we design projects that can't meet budget, we, that are sustainable but can't meet budget, we really haven't achieved what we're here to do. At the same time, we know that we have to design projects that are ecologically regenerative. This is critical for today and for future generations. And certainly, we have to express a sense of social responsibility in the work that we do. Otherwise, we have a, a, we have a misalignment of values and a, and a shear zone. We also have in this giant tent is the continuing saga of cataclysmic events that's shaping societal values. And we also have a changing climate, the Anthropocene. And this is giving us a context now to begin to think differently about design. And so here at the bottom is the fourth bottom line. This is the experiential bottom line. And there's all different ways that that can be expressed by designers. We're not talking about sustainable design as a style. We're talking about it as an ethical foundation, as design from principles. So for example, you could be a technophilic designer like Richard Rogers or Renzo Piano. I don't care. Or you can be a biophilic designer like Frank Lloyd Wright or Emilio Ambas. Or you could be an eco designer like Sim Vanderen or William McDonough. Or you can be a design builder like Jersey Devil, Yes Tomorrow, or the Solar Decathlon. All of these can fit under this umbrella, this giant tent of sustainability to move us more quickly and more profoundly towards a sustainable future. And so now we really are finishing up. This is the wonderful three ring diagram that all of you have either fallen in love with or continue to be confused by. But at the center, at the core of everything we do, I do believe that there is a sense of ethics and a sense of empathy. And I do know that nature is something that is real and tangible and is being impacted in a very real way. So I would like to propose that we are designers as agents, really, to connect our ethical values to dealing with and addressing the problems in the natural world in a very direct way. And so 
what if what if this was all a hoax? What if climate change was all a hoax? What if temperatures go back down? Does that negate sustainability? Doesn't the quadruple bottom line really stand as a matrix for us to move forward as designers, whether or not it's all a hoax? I say, I say, yeah, pretty cool. So isn't authentic sustainability worth it anyway? Yeah, I pretty much think so. And so um, with that, we're going to take a leap over the razor's edge. Are you a laggard? Are you a code compliant architect and designer? Are you a green designer? Or are you an early adopter of sustainable design? Or perhaps you're moving towards a regenerative or integral model. In either case, the razor's edge is moving and eventually you'll have to jump over it. You can jump over it now and take advantage of it or you can jump over it later and wait for it to hit you in the form of codes and requirements. And so I'd like to know at the end of this lecture, could you identify where you are or at least where you'd like to be? I'd hope that you'd like to go to the left side of that razor's edge. And so here we are finally at the end. Here's what we'd like to do. We'd like to develop a biospheric and empathic consciousness for design. We'd like to do small everyday acts of kindness with a purpose. So when you're in your design firm, you can make small acts of sustainability that actually go unnoticed. But ultimately, if we do those two things, our culture will begin to change and is changing, I would argue. And ultimately, you'll see our policies and procedures and laws all come together to actually help us move towards a sustainable future. These and other tiny revolutions are what's going to occur to bring us to where we'd like to be. In the end, our reality will change and become what we expect.